Well, welcome everyone to uh, tonight's American Sheep Industry Association webinar, uh, Feeding and uh, Producing Sheep for Maximum Fiber Production. Is it realistic? I'm uh, happy to have with us here this evening Dr. Nancy Urobeck at Colorado State University. Uh, my name is Jay Parsons, also of Colorado State University. And I'll, in just a moment, I'll be turning uh, uh, the controls over to Dr. Urobeck for our presentation. But first, I want to give thank you to the American Sheep Industry Association and the Rebuild the Sheep Inventory Committee for providing funding for tonight's webinar and want to encourage all of our listeners to uh, learn more about the American Sheep Industry Association by visiting their website at www.sheepusa.org. Um, I also want to let out all of our listeners know that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing. Uh, you'll be receiving a follow-up email in a few days with a link to that. Uh, there will also be a link placed on the Rebuild the Sheep Inventory Committee website which is www.growourflock.org. And uh, you can get to that through the main ASI website also. Um, following Dr. Robeck's talk, which will last about 45 minutes, plus or minus a few minutes, we will have a question and answer session. And uh, so stick around for that. And if you have questions throughout her presentation, you can, if you wish, type them into the uh, question box that should be uh, visible on your control panel and I'll be monitoring those throughout our presentation and then uh, ask her those questions during the Q&A part. You will also have the option, if you so choose, to uh, speak up and ask your question directly to Dr. Olbeck uh, by raising your hand, and you do that by just clicking the little hand uh, symbol that you also have there on your control panel. And uh, assuming you have a microphone attached to your computer, I'll go ahead and unmute you, and then you, you'll be able to speak to her directly uh, when that comes around. So those are... The logistics at this point, uh, I think I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Nancy Urlbeck of Colorado State University. Um, if you saw her credentials, you saw that she's actually in our dean's office now, but don't hold that against her. <laughs> she's, uh, <laughs> uh, she's very knowledgeable on this subject, obviously, and uh, uh, very well respected when it comes to animal nutrition, especially the, uh, small numinate ruminant nutrition. So I'm really looking forward to our presentation and with that I'll turn it over to Dr. Olbeck. Ah, thank you Jay, thank you. And hello everyone, thank you for joining me. Um, this gives me, the webinar gives me an opportunity to talk sheep and uh, as we go along many of the pictures that I have of the animals are of mine and so I'll just go over them as we go along. So following along, let me give you um, I believe fervently, I know this is not a sheep, so forgive me there, but I believe fervently that whenever one presents, whether it's on a webinar or in person, you need to be a little bit um, aware of uh, where your speaker comes from and where their um, kind of their per um, perception as they put together their talk uh, for you. Um, but I like to claim that I'm a pig farmer's daughter. I'm originally from Iowa. Um, way back in the dark ages, but grew up on the land and have been involved um, within agriculture my whole life and have a great passion for it. Through training throughout the years um, from personal choice, I've become a comparative nutritionist. Originally was trained as a ruminant uh, with cattle and sheep, uh, the small ruminant being um, the greatest joy. But over the years have taken on other species, as you can see in the slide. Um, I do some camelid work. Uh, the strange little creature in the bottom is a hedgehog, so I have uh, kind of done companion animals. We've gone uh, that wallaby stretching up in uh, the right-hand corner of your slide. I have been a zoo nutritionist for 20-some years, though I'm starting to leave that area. I just don't have enough time to do everything. This is a picture of me in one of the fields. Um, or one of my rented pastures, and it's my outstanding in the field picture. And uh, I'm going to give you a few of my biases as, as I go along. Many of you may not recognize the breeds as we go along. I have a predominantly wool breed uh, flock, and you'll see that most of them are covered. You'll notice that they have blankets, but there is always one little imp, and particularly when it rains, is going to lose their blanket. So I have one naked sheep out there. If after this webinar uh, you have more questions than we started, 
uh, that maybe is my cynical side, but then I'll have uh, achieved what I've wanted. I am a lifelong learner, and I like to instill that enthusiasm, that uh, great joy in learning and looking for the next answer. So if you're wondering where in the heck I'm going, stay with me. This is my favorite slide. Uh, I like to think that I am there, a sheep or a wolf in sheep's clothing, because many people think sheep, they think meat. But my primary emphasis over the years that I've had the flock has been in wool production. So I guess I'm the wolf in sheep's clothing. This is one of my Lincoln fleeces, if you're familiar with the Lincoln breed, one of the largest breeds. But uh, I love the feel of fiber, particularly with long wools, though I have some fine wool and some hair breeds you'll see as we go along. This is one of my Lincolns with an emphasis on the wool sheep. Uh, I have the Ramadale CDMs uh, for my fine wool. Uh, Wenslingdales, um, the characteristic, uh, you're starting to see more of the full bloods within the U.S. as with the teaswater that you see in this slide. Uh, they're nice and squeaky clean, getting ready for a show. And here are a group of my students working with uh, the flock as we're getting ready to, in this case, going up to Estes Park. The genetics that it took to bring these breeds into the U.S. has been through artificial insemination. Uh, with sheep, it is not um, until recently there is some uh, research ongoing. We can now use some vaginal insemination, but predominantly still it's a surgical procedure, a laparoscopic uh, intrauterine surgery where the sheep is put into the table and upside down and uh, going in and depositing the semen directly into, um, into the horns as you go in. This is expensive. I think somewhat perhaps hard on the animals, but uh, until recently it was the only way to increase the genetics of these animals, uh, and uh, at 96 percent is considered full blood. We don't even have uh, this luxury as of now. Uh, semen has been shut off of being brought in from outside of the U.S. The concerns uh, of a virus being transmitted. Um, Dr. Parsons Jay had indicated to me that there are a few of you interested in the hair breeds, and so I went ahead and included a slide of one of my Caracal use Augustine with uh, a pair of twins. And of course, I had to show my big ram with his horns. So the Caracal breed is a hair sheep, which is a little bit different than the wool breeds uh, that we're going to be emphasizing as we talk and go along this evening. I like to think that I've done a little bit, and this is uh, one of the times that I was recognized. Uh, this was at the Wool Festival in Taos. And so I like to think that I am achieving something with the fiber as we go along. So that's a little bit of an introduction of myself. Um, please uh, take Dr. Parsons up on the opportunity to ask questions. It's hard doing a one way I like. Um, working with groups where there's a lot of interaction. So let's first indicate what are you going to look for in good fiber. And what you'll find in the literature is that you want a low micron count and you want a fleece weight. And as I started putting these talks together, the first time I talked on the impact of nutrition on fiber production, I was quite surprised on what I found and what I didn't find in the literature. Most of the research has been done in Australia. New Zealand and in India. It's only in the last few years we've seen a little bit within the U.S. and uh, that has been minimal. But predominantly in Australia and in New Zealand and within the Merino. So much of the data that I'm going to be presenting to you this afternoon is going to be with the Merino. So more of the fine wool, super fine wool as we go along. Um, I'm, assuring, I'm sure that some of you are kind of chuckling right now. This had hit the news a few years ago. This was Shrek Merino in New Zealand who had escaped shearing, uh, if you read in the newspapers, for six years. And when he was ultimately captured, he had over 60 pounds of wool. That probably sold for a lot of money on eBay, who's to say. But uh, this is a picture of Shrek, uh, one of the Merinos from New Zealand. So back to the feeding and producing maximum fiber production. Is it realistic? I'm going to take a little bit different approach, perhaps, 
than maybe what you expected tonight. I'm not going to tell you what feeds to use uh, or how to feed them, except perhaps a little bit at the end. I'm going to give you why we need to feed what we do. So looking at the factors that affect fiber, let's look at the fiber as it comes from the animal. The predominant impact is going to come from genetics and in the environment. So using those two factors, we're going to break them out and look a little bit on the, how we can control those two variables. Um, thanks to Yoka McCall here in Denver, who allowed me to use his slides, I'm into the electron microscopy. And these are just a few of the slides off of his website, again, with his permission. And you can the URL is on the top of the right hand. And so you too can go and uh, pull those off or look at those on his website. If you're going to use them, I probably would uh, double check, validate with him. But looking at the electron microscopy slides, you'll see a coarse wool. Uh, then there's a finer wool, the finer wool probably with your merinos and the cashmere, even more fine, and the mohair gives you an idea of what we see and the cuticles uh, of the wool as we go along. Here again is another slide from a different source, the fine merino. Look at the cuticles on the side compared to more of the wool, typical wool fiber, and then perhaps a Chinese wool. And uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on the structure of these fibers, but just to give you um, a perception that of what we can do to test the different wools, to look at the, to measure the microns, to evaluate different wool quality. And I'm in hopes that with the resurgence and the interest of wool, we'll see more and more of this coming on in the next few years. This is again another slide from uh, Yoka McCall. And this one is going to kind of start to, to lend you the idea of how the fiber microscopy can show the impact of what we're doing. You look way on the left-hand side. And Jay, I know you showed me how I could, I think here I got my spotlight. All right. This can, I'm hoping that all of you can see this here. But uh, this would be a fiber. We have the tip, the shaft, and the root. Here is an example of a lamb wool fiber always have this sharp little tip because it's never been, uh, it's never been uh, sheared. And my predominant sale of fiber is with hand spinners. And my hand spinners love the lamb wool, not only because with a younger animal you have a more fine, the microns are less, but because they have that peculiar little curled tip on the end. And so they can always tell if it is indeed the first lamb's fleece. The middle fiber. This is a, uh, a fiber that has been sheared, and you can see the blunt end there. This is a slide that will really sharp, uh, make an example of what we're going to talk this evening. Look at this. Um, this is an animal that has uh, had a poor diet, and with a poor diet, you have a very thin fiber, and you think, well, maybe that's good. Maybe I should always feed animals poor to have a thinner fiber to get my um, low micron. I would not advise that. What you'll see are an increase of fractures, increase of breaks, and particularly with the fine wools, that tends to be a uh, major uh, component to a bad fleece. This is a fair diet, and this is a good feed. Overfeeding, as you can see here, um, gives you a more coarse wool, and so overdoing it and uh, treating the animals um, so that they become fat is almost as bad as underfeeding them when it comes to um, wool quality. This last one, you can see there's a stress break. This is the reason why with my fine wools, my Ramadale CDMs, and I have some Merino Cross, I have some Australian Bonds, and uh, bringing in some Perindale, what I find is that I shear these animals right before I land. So I'm shearing the end of December, first part of January, and people think, oh my god, these poor animals, you're shearing them now when they most need their coats. And in reality, if I do not take their wool at that time, I have a two-way problem. First, I'll get a stress break, as shown here with the fiber microscopy, and the wool is of little value. The second is if I don't 
shear the animals before lambing. We have, when you lamb in January and February in Colorado, there's often a chance of snow. And if those animals are hot, they're going into labor. Um, if any of my, the viewers here are women, you know what it's like going into labor. You get a little bit hot. And so the best way to go is to lay in a snowbank and get cool. Well, then I get lamb sickles. And uh, snow and lamb sickles uh, don't help the profit real well. And so I share the animals to save my fleece and to go ahead and to save my lambs. All right, we're going to go back to school for a little bit and look at um, perhaps a diagram. You're going to think, indeed, you're going to vet school or something, but not so important that you remember all of the bits, but just to give you an idea that I do have a reason and there is an explanation for what I'm going to be walking through within the next, within the next few slides. And the follicles um, for fiber production are actually an extension of the skin. So the wool is part of the animal skin. And this just gives a e uh, quick idea of um, the structure. Going to the next slide, uh, this is, again, electron microscopy, and I'm going to go ahead and do my little spotlight. This is what um, is the structure of a primary follicle, and I'm going to explain the difference between a primary and a secondary follicle, and there's going to be a difference in these two follicles and what it has to do with uh, fiber production in your animals. The derm is the skin. The sebaceous gland right here is actually the gland that produces lanolin. The, when you're working with the fleeces, your hands get nice and soft, the lanolin. Um, the sweat glands are always associated as well as the, the sebaceous gland here. Um, these are always associated with these primary follicles, as is this little muscle gland. And if an animal was to raise, uh, if you've ever seen a dog and the hair kind of stands on their, their back, that has to do with a muscular, he, um, um, come on little slide, I guess I have to shut this off before I can go, there it goes. It actually helps lift, lift the follicle up. And I see that I put my slide in upside down, but the point is saying uh, that I'm going to bring from all of this is the maximum number of follicles that a lamb can form is determined genetically. You can't change that other than by breeding your animals through your different uh, lines and different brand rams that you're using, but the actual number of follicles that an animal is going to produce is controlled by the environment, and that's you. And we're going to go into more depth now as we go. Again, primary follicle, the sweat gland that I showed you, um, the muscle, um, the muscle fiber, and the sebaceous gland or the lanolin. Now let's talk about the secondary follicle. It only has a sebaceous gland with it, so there's a little bit of difference. Now, again, emphasizing the factors affecting the fiber are going to be the genetics and the environment. Let's talk genetics first. It is rare, and because I, I can't um, connect with you a little bit more closely, I, can't, uh, I like to ask the audience, how many of you have range sheep? How many of you predominantly are pasture grazers, but it is rare for a pasture sheep that their only source of nutrition is in uh, the grazing. It is rare for them to reach their maximum genetic potential for wool production. For maximum genetic um, expression, one would need to supply extra feed. And when one is working with sheep, and if it is, uh, has an impact on your income, the more that you feed, um, the more it's going to cost. I have to caution you, uh, there are many that have tried to breed genetically finer and finer, and you've probably, some of you who are working with hand spinners or who are trying to get a finer product to the market, a finer, uh, lower micron, there is always the concern with the consistent selection of um, working on that one trait. And I know way on, again, I'm going to go to my little marker here, 
I know that those are not sheep in those little bundles. Those are actually pigs, and uh, they're in China. And these pigs were selected for um, how they get along, for very calmness. And so there's an impact. So there's always a concern when one selects consistently for one trait. And I know, again, this is not a sheep. But when we have selected dairy cows for greater milk production, along with that goes mouth hunger. And so by continually selecting for greater milk production, they want to eat more. And if anyone has worked with Holstein animals, you'll find that if you put them in a pen, they will. If there's a chain to be licked or if you were to put in a piece of equipment that has a lot of paint on it, they will just literally lick the paint off because they have to do something with their mouth um, because of that genetic selection. So anytime you consistently select for one trait, there's concern. With hogs, the impact of selecting for the lean muscled animals, we get the pale soft exudated pork that you can see on the left hand slide. Uh, that strange creature that really is a pig on the left is what we started with and perhaps more popular during uh, late World War II when we were using fat for uh, tallow and, or for the lard that went into ammunition production. So again, factors affecting fiber. I think or I hope, and if you have questions, please bring them, uh, let's discuss them later. Genetics, you can only do so much, and you still have to be careful Never select consistently for fiber. Watch your confirmation. Watch the health of the animal and other traits as you go along. Now let's go to the fun part, the environment. And I'm going to, even though I'm a nutritionist, I like to look at the impact and the cross of reproduction by nutrition. And the first 50 days of pregnancy, this is when uh, there is very little fetal growth. Uh, you can barely tell that the animal is pregnant, or you can't. Um, after day 50, 50 to 100, you're going to see rapid placenta growth. And that is the body's way of getting ready to start feeding the fetus. Because at day 100, what we call the third trimester is when we get rapid fetal growth, and 90% of the fetus growth occurs at this time. So this is why when we talk about feeding sheep, we break it into the first trimester, the second trimester, and the third trimester. The third trimester is when we need the most groceries. That's when you're going to have to feed the animal most. I use this slide in a lot of my classes. Physiological status means the life stage that the animal is at. We have growth, and I break growth down into three parts. Um, the neonate, that's the newborn animal, versus early growth, versus late growth. And I have the neonate in a different color. That means we need more energy. We need more protein. We need more vitamins. We need more minerals. The next physiological state that I'm using there is flushing. For those of you who are not familiar with flushing, uh, my animals, I've just finished flushing now. And for the last several months, what I have done is I've kept them on what it could be considered a maintenance diet. Uh, they're not going to gain weight. They're not going to lose weight. We maintain them. I didn't want them to have a lot of energy. Now, two weeks before I'm going to start to breed, I bring in a high level of alfalfa forage. I bring in about a half a pound of grain to each of the animals on a daily basis. And for two weeks, and for the first week or so that I have the rams with the ewes is when I have that higher plane of nutrition. And uh, again, the flushing is highlighted, so we have a higher plane. Gestation, the first two-third trimester versus the last. The last trimester is when we have, again, the greatest demand for nutrients. Switching to the next, lactation, when the, after the ewe has had her lambs and is starting to nurse, the early versus late lactation, early the first eight weeks, but particularly the first four weeks is when we need the most nutrients. After that time, the lamb can start feeding itself a little bit and then it maintenance. So I will use this slide uh, a couple different times, but keeping in mind 
um, when you feed the animal the most nutrients rather than consistently feeding a solid plane of nutrition. And let me go back to the flushing. If prior to flushing you had fed the animals a high plane of nutrition, you will not see an impact. And perhaps for those of you who are not familiar, the reason for flushing is uh, if the animals had been on a maintenance diet and now you're flushing them or adding that higher plane of nutrients, what that does is increases the number of eggs that are ovulated and the potential for more lambs. And so we flush them for a greater prolificacy for more lambs at that time. I probably should have indicated that a little sooner. This is data from um, actually from New Zealand work done in the 60s and this was a ewe that was um, harvested or sacrificed and her body was slipped into a tank of liquid nitrogen so that her body was frozen. At that time they went and uh, using a saw cut her in half. Flipping on my little spotlight here, this is the rumen capacity where part of the stomach where the greatest amount of forage is going to be stored. So her stomach, if you wanted to use that capacity. Um, there's no fetus. Um, you'll see there's a high level of fat as we go. So an animal at maintenance, non-pregnant, that's what her rumen size would look. Okay, I have to shut my little spotlight off. This is 88 days of 150 days gestation or the middle of the second trimester. What you're seeing is this fetus, a single fetus, and this animal is halfway through. Notice we still have a large room in capacity, so the ewe can still eat a lot. So if you remember back to when I was talking about the first semester, trimester, the second trimester, here is when she's going to start to eat a little bit more. Here's where we're going to see the greater placenta growth that's going to support that lamb when it starts to take off and start growing. All right, here we are in 112 days. Look at the size of the fetus. We're entering into that first part. We have the placenta created. Um, the animal has the animal's body. Look at the capacity of the rumen. And still we have 30-some days left to go. So what's going to happen? She can't eat so much. So how you have fed that you up to this point is critical. You wanted to maintain her and maybe even to start to put on a little bit of extra energy, a little extra fat, so that she's ready for the, extra, uh, for the demand of the fetus as it goes in. Here we're at 123 days. And so this animal is almost to the point, look at the room and capacity and she's actually carrying twins. Here's one fetus here, and here's another fetus here. So she's carrying twins. And so those of you who've had flocks, and you have a ewe carrying twins, particularly if it's a younger animal or a maiden ewe, you will find that they tend to lamb a little bit earlier just because they don't have the capacity to consume uh, enough feed and for those of you, again, that have worked with sheep, you know you can't feed them all grain. You have to have a high quality of forage to help her. And even with the high quality of forage and a little bit of uh, grain at this time, you know that often they get very, very thin. So it gives you a perception of what's going on with the animal. And she still has 20-some days left to go. Here's a picture of one of my Wenslingdale ewes, and uh, I felt so sorry for her. Uh, she was miserable. In fact, uh, often she didn't lay down. She would actually sit up like a dog. She was so gravid. And uh, I understood later when she actually gave birth to quads. And so one of my sets of uh, Wenslingdale quads was from this ewe. All right. Again, reminding you where we are with our physiological state and how we feed the animal. And we go back to this primary follicle and the secondary follicle that I set you up as we go. The reason why I gave you that setup, primary follicle development is from day 60 
to day 90. So at the end, if you break up into trimesters, the first 50 days is the first trimester, the second 50 days is going to be your second trimester, and the last 50 days is your third, day 60 to 90, that's going to be in your second trimester. That's when we get primary follicle development. Primary follicle development, if you look in the bottom, we have genetics by nutrition. That is genetically determined. You can't change that. That is going to be, uh, it's the coarsest follicle, it's the main follicle, um, and you can't change that no matter what you do. But now look, this is where you can have the greatest impact. The secondary follicle development is from day 90, and that's almost to the end of the second trimester. So it fits very well with the physiological stage that I had indicated to birth. This is when you get secondary follicles that are going to be developed. Um, it will be determined before that you lambs. It cannot be changed. And so if you are feeding the animals according to the physiological status and feed the most nutrients in that third trimester, not before, but maintaining it according to that, you will have the greatest amount of secondary follicles produced. It's the secondary follicles that are going to make you the money. It's the second follicles that are going to add the density to the fleece to give you a greater fleece weight. So let's go a little bit more. So again, genetics. Primary follicles begin to form in the skin, as I've indicated. And the environment or the impact of the nutrition is from day 50 to uh, birth, just as a summary. Here is uh, a slide that I took off one of the websites that I found, and the URL is on the bottom, and you'll have access to these slides later so you can look them up. But on the left-hand side, pulling up my little spotlight here, you can see, again, electron microscopy slide, of a ewe that was with, or a lamb that was born uh, where the ewe had a low plane of nutrition. The orange, if you're not colorblind, um, the orange or the, the larger ones there are going to be those individual, uh, the primary follicles. The little blue with the smaller dots are going to be those that are the secondary follicles. Compare that here to good nutrition on the right-hand side. You'll see that the number of primary follicles didn't change between the two slides, but look at the number of secondary follicles because we fed them right. All right, I'm a very visual person. I like to see uh, visually what's going on, and that was the best way that I could express it to myself. So nutrition impacts are greatest from pre-weaning so when the, when the lamb is still nursing, late pregnancy and lactation, and then post-weaning. So let's see what that means. I, I slipped this in slide uh, in uh, right before we talked, and Jay was kind of laughing at me, but uh, as I stuck old Shrek in here again, but again, it's the fine wools that you're going to have the greatest impact on nutrition. Uh, it's the fine wools that I struggle with most. And there are times when I have taken, I've, uh, I've bought a U um, that was shipped across from the West Coast or the East Coast, and I might as well just share it because there's the break in the fiber. Just the stress. Uh, something happens in the animal's life. I had, we have a lot of rattlesnakes here in Colorado, and I had a U that was snake bit by a rattlesnake, and there was a break in her fiber, and so I just had to shear it and take it away. Uh, perhaps an animal has a high fever. Sometimes if there is a tornado or a storm, the impact on the fiber, and I don't see that with my long wools. They're pretty much dummy proof, but with the fine wool, takes the greatest um, management, is the greatest husbandry. I know that in New Zealand there are confinement operations where weathers, merino weathers, are kept on the floor, similar um, to what we might do with um, hogs or poultry in confinement setting, and they are kept expressly clean. But the, the wool that comes out of those weather barns um, is, brings the high price. Those would be considered the super fine. So going back. If poor nutrition during pregnancy and early lactation, it will impose a permanent limitation for wool production that will never change. 
you can't go back and fix it no matter how well you feed the animal. So it's definitely in that third trimester is when you have to pay attention. Uh, lambs whose dams are poorly fed, whose uh, the ewes are poorly fed, uh, they will have less secondary follicle development. And as I indicated, that's where your money is. That's where it makes a difference. Um, the progeny of young ewes. My um, long wolves, I don't uh, breed as a, to lamb as a yearling, whereas I do with my fine wolves. But their first lambs will have less secondary follicle development because when you breed them to lamb as a yearling, they're still growing themselves. And so they have a greater energy. Um, there are those that says, well, I just won't breed them till later. But then you have to think back. If you wait another year, that means you have to feed them two years to get your first set. And so with my fine, fine wolves, I go ahead and I breed um, so that they lamb at the first. Another thing, twin lambs, there's going to be less secondary follicle development. Uh, triplets the same way. My quads definitely will have less because the the lambs in utero, those fetuses in utero, are competing for the same amount of nutrients. And so they will have less secondary follicle development. And compare the slide with the second lamb versus a multiple. Perhaps you need to ultrasound because you'll find that the ewe carrying multiple fetuses. Um, here it costs me, depending on who I have to do it, one and a half to three dollars to ultrasound ewes. Um, and if I can separate those ewes that have multiple fetuses and feed them and my yearling, uh, those that will uh, be coming a year as they're going to lamb for the first time at a higher plane of nutrition and feed the older ewes or those that are carrying single separately, I save a little money. But it also it takes more pen space. So that's, again, and if you can find someone to ultrasound your animals. Now, as I was talking to someone, they said, well, well, why, why, why do you want that second lamb? Maybe you always just want singles. Why does everyone always go on and try to get multiple births? And again, it goes back to economics. Um, it depends on what your operation is set up for. Uh, if you have two lambs instead of one, yes, there'll be fewer um, secondary follicle development, but you have the second lamb. And so is that offset? And I think that's obvious if you're in meat production. Mine with the calls, uh, I use for meat production. And so those that don't make the grain for the fleece, I call them from the flock. And uh, I, can't, I cannot justify not having, trying to have twins or triplets, even though I know that the fiber will be a little bit different. So to summarize for that a little bit, pre-weaning environment is critical for realizing the ge genetic potential of the individual sheep and that you cannot compensate at a later time. Secondary fibers are the most important. Reduction in nutrition, uh, we've talked um, higher secondary follicle density associated with decreased fiber diameter and higher fleece weight. So that's going to be your best fiber. And secondary fibers contribute to the majority of the fiber in the adult wool fleece. Um, also, age of the animal, sex of the animal, and level of nutrition. My older animals, the fleece quality uh, deteriorates. I have not, as of yet, found a, a way to compensate for that. And often I find that with the older animals, I no longer sell in a hand-spinning market uh, for a fleece. I may use it for roving or for yarn, but the older animals, the quality isn't where I would like it. I find that my rams, in general, tend to have a little more coarse um, fiber. Um, weathers, I find deteriorate, quickly, uh, deteriorate more quickly, and that's just with my flock and with my set of animals, and I'd be happy um, to discuss that with others. Uh, and then the level of nutrition I think we've addressed. So what do you look for? Again, the amount of wool and the low micron count. A couple slides to bring everything that I've discussed a little bit um, kind of to a head as we talk here. Um, on the left-hand side is your clean fleece weight. And you'll see that it is in kilograms because, as I indicated, most of this data is from New Zealand and then Australia. 
2.2 pounds into one kilogram. So the clean fleece weight on the left. The red color or those, uh, the bars to the left hand side in each grouping is where the animals have lost a half a body condition score. The green or the one on the right of each uh, are those that maintain their condition score. They were fed to meet their physiological status. And you can see the single lamb versus the twin lamb. The single is going to have a greater fleece weight than the twin. Do you want more twins? Do you want more fiber? That's an individual decision that you will have to make. Again, similar. Uh, the clean fleece weight on the left on the uh, axis, the bottom condition score change. So the one closest to the axis here is where they've actually lost 2.2 pounds or two condition scores or a condition score and then moving um, to the right, they're actually gaining a little weight. And you can see the difference in fleece weight with single lambs versus twins, just to, to bring it to head. Um, switching from fleece weight to fiber diameter, you'll notice on the axis with the fiber diameter, we go from 17 or the smallest to 18. Again, losing a body condition score in the red or the left bar. This is where an animal is single. You'll find that it has a lower micron than a twin. So comparing that. And again, using the same, um, but again, or using the other graph with single lambs and twin lambs, you see the same thing. As an animal uh, gains condition weight, you'll see the impact on the fiber. So going back to my slide with the physiological status, remember to feed when the energy requirements are the greatest. This gives you a little bit, being the nutritionist, we always want to say, um, put it in the form of how much to feed the animal. Uh, using an average of 154 pound U and just looking at calcium and phosphorus, you see that an animal at maintenance, a U at maintenance, has less than the first 15 weeks of pregnancy less than at flushing, you see the later gestation and flipping on to my little spotlight here, this side being 130 to 150 days, this one being 180 uh, to 225. All right, lactation, the singles versus the twins. Shutting that off and moving on. First cutting versus second cutting. Um, I have heard many sheep producers say, I cannot feed alfalfa, alfalfa because they will become fat on the alfalfa. I actually feed a lot of alfalfa in Colorado because it costs predominantly. Uh, grass is much more expensive because of the horse people population that we have. The first cutting, the stems are going to be uh, thicker than you will see on the third cutting. And there's less leaves with the first cutting than the third. So dollar for pound, dollar per ton, the third cutting is going to be the most economical if you're trying to buy for energy and for nutrients. I use um, a second cutting if I can or a third cutting. But I only feed to meet their nutrient needs. And then what I will, ugh, I'm going backwards. We're going back. Go back. All righty. Jay, do you know how to back up on this? That's one slide I didn't. All right. Um, the slide that I used um, with the grain, that's all right, Jay. I'll cover oh, it. Okay. Um, with the grain, um, I was talking about the alfalfa with the first cutting and the second cutting. I tend to use the second if I can get it or I buy the third, but I only feed enough to meet their nutrient needs. And I'm going to talk about that in just a little minute to pull it together. The next slide I had was on coarse grain or on fine grain. And you'll find you don't have to go and pay the extra money for cracked corn or flake corn. You can use the whole, what we call whole shell corn because sheep chew very, very fine. So why pay the extra money? In fact, if you feed a uh, very fine grain, you see that more of the animals become ill. They tend to get acidosis, um, which is uh, something when you feed too much grain to a ruminant. 
Um, this slide here, catching up with my slides, is uh, a couple lambs coming through a creek feed. And the reason why I use this is twofold. One is that I use third cutting alfalfa as a creek feed. I'll maybe use a little bit of grain that has vitamins, but I use predominantly third cutting alfalfa to get these lambs up and running. Uh, again, my third cutting slide, and this is what I was looking for. This right here, what I do is I use a lot of corn stalks. So I only feed the alfalfa, if I'm using the third cutting alfalfa or the second cutting alfalfa, only enough to meet their needs for feeding. I'll feed them once a day. The rest of the time, they get corn stalks, very low quality. Um, I make sure that there are not a lot of, a lot of nitrates concerns. Sometimes uh, if it's a drought year or if the uh, corn plants have been really stressed, the concern is with nitrates, but I use a lot of corn stalks and that keeps the animals busy because if I were to feed just enough alfalfa to meet their nutrient needs, they cry. They don't have enough to eat. And so by using the corn stalks, they're very happy. Uh, they don't, they'll even get fat on them to some extent, those that are more easy keepers. But for me, it cuts down my cost and it keeps me from overfeeding my animals. So something to think about and that may be a value uh, to your, your flock as you move along. Uh, this is a picture after one of our storms in 2009. And you can see I had to dig a path to get to my animals. And the reason why I put this, and particularly in times like this, heated water makes a big difference. Um, by heated water, the animals tend to eat more and to maintain their condition because the stress of that cold weather, particularly this is about when we perhaps want to uh, lamb, um, if they're not eating enough, I may see uh, an example of ketosis or other metabolic pregnancy toxemia that can occur because they're not eating enough. So uh, I found that waters are worth their weight in gold, uh, the heated waters as we go along. I would encourage you to have your hay tested so that particularly if you have a larger num number of animals, it's not going to be cost effective if you only have a few in your flock. Right now we have about 150 to 160 breeding ewes in my flock. So for me, I can't afford not uh, to do my feed analysis so that I know what I'm feeding. I use this slide, and this is particularly important in Colorado where we are um, because of twofold. In Colorado, we have high molybdenum levels, and the high molybdenum will tie up copper. And with my long wool animals, particularly with natural color, I have to feed higher levels of copper, even though I am, as a nutritionist, to know that um, you have to be very careful with feeding it. These are Angus cattle. I know they're not sheep uh, in uh, Colorado. And you notice the difference in their hair coat? That's because of chromo, a chromotrichia, uh, a change in uh, their hair coat. Uh, you'll see breaks. You call it steely wool. I have to be very aware of copper in Colorado. I have to also be aware, and if you're in some of the eastern states where molybdenum isn't an issue, you do not want to feed a hog mineral, a dairy mineral, or a horse mineral to your sheep because the copper levels will be way too high. The incident of feeding the higher copper, perhaps in Colorado, is due predominantly to the molybdenum. I get a lot of questions. Should I feed black salt or loose? salt. I use black. Uh, in fact, I've gone to also adding the blue block, which is the cobalt, uh, to add uh, cobalt to increase energy um, through the um, conversion with the volatile fatty acid in the animals. To caution you again, overfeeding creates more of a coarse wool, so be careful on how you're feeding. Keep your records. Uh, I have uh, I have a a record book like this, this was taken in 2011, but I have a record book where I keep anal records for everything. And now I'm in the process of moving them to a computer system, keep records. If you have a U that has a varying amount of um, fiber, and particularly if you're skirting these, keep records on who gives the greatest um, grease fleece weight, 
who doesn't. Uh, keeping good records helps with your genetic selections as you go. So I'm hoping that I answered some of your questions in feeding and producing sheep uh, for maximum fiber production. Uh, is it realistic? You bet. Feed according to physiological status, um, but be cognizant of how you're feeding and the impact on potential wool productions. Um, questions? Jay, do we have questions? Yeah, we do have a, a question that was typed in. I just want to remind our listeners that you can either type your questions into the question box or you can uh, flick or click that little hand symbol that you're seeing over there in your uh, uh, control panel. And if you have a microphone connected, I can just call on you and unmute your microphone and you can ask your question directly. Uh, Callie has typed in a question back when you were talking about the multiple bursts in the uh, second follicle development. She said, does the fact that multiple bursts results in less second follicle development continue in those breeds known for producing multiple bursts? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's my understanding. But also, Callie, be cognizant of the fact most of the research that was there uh, were done on merinos. But all of the data that I could find say that even those I'm thinking maybe the pin, the fin, or the polypay, uh, yes, that impact would be there. That's my understanding. Okay. And Leah says that uh, she, she also raises CBM Roman Romandels, and she, <laughs> she struggles with selecting for replacements when they are so young. The fleeces are all fine when they are lambs. I end up feeding potential replacements for longer. Any suggestions? She, uh, I didn't quite hear that. Say that again. You tend to feed the replacements for what? For longer. Um, so I don't know. It says uh, when they're uh, selecting, she has struggle, struggled selecting for replacements when they are so young. The fleeces are all fine when they are lambs. Okay. And then okay. she ends up uh, feeding them longer, potential replacements longer. Any suggestions? Okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure I'm going to answer your uh, question with the way you want it. What I do is uh, I have kept, again, I'm anal on keeping my records. And what I do is, for example, I use 150 days as a marker. And I will measure the lambs and kind of back calculate. I, I look for fiber length and I look for crimp. And I have done it long enough that if I have an animal that has a very long fleece, so that at 150 days it has a two-inch staple, but it has no crimp, I call it. I'll use it for meat, or I'll sell it to someone else. Okay. Um, if I have an animal that has a very short fleece at that time period, but has a lot of crimp, eh, I might uh, keep it for a little bit longer. Um, Leah, you may have to type back in, is that what uh, you were asking? Okay. And I'll see if she types back in and, and uh, I'd love to talk to her more later yeah yes. and Leah if you have a microphone connected you can just raise your hand and and uh, talk directly if that helps uh, Jennifer in Colorado wants to know do you test livers on butcher lambs for CU levels um, I have not to date um, that's I know of people who have done that it can be done but anytime these assays that are done um, you you start paying more money. If I were to have an issue and we're losing animals, I would definitely. But it's not been a problem. Uh, I, I analyze the hay and I feed accordingly. I had brought a load of hay in from Montana that was high in molybdenum. And so I fed a little bit higher copper. Um, when my, ten, my copper to molybdenum ratio is 10 to 1, that's what I shoot for. I don't, I don't do the livers. Okay. We got a question from the southeast U.S. Um, okay. where <laughs> grain is expensive, as pointed uh -huh. out here. <laughs> she wants to know, uh, Susan wants to know, do you feed grain all year on grass? Um, she is uh, working with a pasture that consists of fescue with some orchard grass. She's raising Montadales and Romandale CBMs on it. And, okay. Uh, so, any suggestions okay. there for her? Well, I, I don't... Um I empathize with your parasite load that you're going to be dealing with, so I would say having a good parasite control record would be first and foremost. Um, I don't know what your pasture is like, so I'm just kind of guessing. If you remember the slide, um, pasture animals, unless you're feeding additional feed, you won't get to their genetic potential. 
there, I don't know what your forage cost, if you have any other additional feed that you can. With my sheep, the only times I feed grain are those in the periods of high nutrient requirements, and that's flushing, late um, gestation, early lactation. I never feed gra uh, grain to my lambs after 100 days. Uh, that's when I take them off grain, unless I have an animal that is, um, maybe I have a coccidia breakout or something that I didn't manage correctly, I might feed them a little grain to bring them back. But I don't like feeding grain. There are other feed sources that you might consider. Uh, I don't know if you have access to uh, maybe beet pulp, if you have access to any of the other higher um, forward or maybe a little bit of alfalfa might compensate for that, and again, I don't know. But look forward to it. I think grain is going to be cheaper this year because the demand for ethanol is decreased, and the latest reports is uh, corn is supposed to come down to three and a quarter a bushel. So I hope that's a little help. Okay. Linda asks, what heritable traits travel together with wool fineness in general? Huh. <laughs> Linda, I don't know. You got me. Well done. <laughs> I would have to, I would have to look. Okay. Um, Julie says if you're looking for low micron count and fleece weight, it seems you're missing a variable of fleece consistency. For example, I have sheep with fleece with staple length of three inches on the shoulder, but 1.5 inches elsewhere. Another sheep may have beautiful shoulder wool, but camp in the bridge. <laughs> How important is fleece oh, consistency? <laughs> How important is fleece consistency? And then she follows up with, "Can nutrition change this in any way?" Okay, okay. good question. Uh, and this is Susan J. Uh, this is Julie. Julie, good question. Um, I have several animals that I have skirted in the last couple of days with variable fleeces. I I call them from my flock. Uh, what I will do with that fleece is I'll break it into a couple different fleeces so that it's more consistent. Uh, that is more of a genetic thing, and uh, I strictly call those from my flock. Uh, I don't know. That's not a nutrition concern that I'm aware of. And all of the data that I looked at, um, I know that the research that was done, they took samples from the various parts, but um, that is not a nutrition or an environmental factor that's genetics, I would call them. Okay. We have a question from Virginia, from Barbara. She uh, says, we are copper deficient in Virginia. Do you recommend giving copper bolus? Uh, Barbara, I'm always hesitant with copper boluses because you run the risk, and I'm very familiar with those boluses. They're used a lot in the elk industry uh, with the hope for antler production. But because sheep are so sensitive, I would prefer to feed uh, it directly and to control it. There are too many variables with the copper boluses in my mind, and again, that's a personal preference. It would be easier to use it. You don't have to worry about it, but you could worry about it because you could lose an animal. So I would, uh, I prefer to orally feed it. Okay. And uh, Leah wants to know, for use with more secondary follicles, do they always have higher fleece weights? Um, the that's the presumption. If they have a, a greater number, if you are feeding the animal correctly, it would be yes. If you're not, I would say no. Okay. That's to the best of my understanding. Leah. And Fran wants to know, do you count crimp? And specifically, she says at uh, 150 days, what would you prefer the count to be? Okay, the count for the crimp, again, depends on the ones on the breed that you're doing. Uh, as I work, uh, I have brought in um, several merino, the Doni merinos from Australia. I brought in semen until I couldn't. And um, I brought some in from Texas, the higher crimp. And I'm doing this, I'm, I'm shooting from the hip. The greater number is what I'm looking for. I do not count it. I do know that people are. Uh, merino would have more. The longer wools would have less. So it depends on the breed you're working with. Okay. And Julie uh, asked a question. I've seen some fleeces with a distinct grease stripe, suggestive of excess feeding is her question. And then how do you control for the grease content of fleeces without compromising fiber qualities? <laughs> oh, I empathize there. My Lincolns, 
when if you look at some of the blankets, uh, they walk around, their blankets are just black. And uh, I do not know of how to feed to compensate that. That is just the nature of the beast. Um, the, if you remember back to the slides, the sebaceous glands, they're with the primary follicle and with the secondary follicle. Um, and some breeds, my Lincolns in particular, are much more prone to have higher grease. And uh, there's nothing that you can do. Uh, but it will wash out, and it looks quite nice when you're done. OK. Uh, Robin asked about, what about the unimproved breeds like Shetlands? Is there any difference in feed requirements than with more improved breeds? I okay. free, she free feeds kelp. Is that of any significance with respect to fleece? OK. Uh, good question. I have uh, several friends with Shetlands, and so I work with quite a few Shetlands. You follow the same principles of the physiological stage. I don't feed kelp. I know that there are those that promote it. The reason why I don't is because the sources of kelp that we have in the US, uh, or I guess anywhere, are not controlled. And some batches that are test, your iodine levels are toxic. And some, there's none. Um, most people feed it for micronutrients. I think that there may be other ways, and I would not consistently feed it in my flock. OK. Ellen says, what about dual-coated breeds? Does everything still apply? OK, dual-coated um, breeds, um, the most, uh, like my caracals, uh, I have a double coat. And I, if I'm not mistaken, the Jacobs. And so I'm shooting again from the hip, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, the same applies with the, uh, with the double coated, with my caracals. Uh, with the wool, actually, I have some single coated caracals and some double coated. Um, I would use the very same principles. OK. And some questions on feeding again here. Uh, Susan says, I keep hearing that feeding corn causes the fleece to yellow or have yellow streaks. Has that been documented? Or what do you have to say That's about it? That's not been documented, and I don't believe it. OK. And Jerry says, do you provide a mineral supplement for your sheep? Um, Jerry, I do not. Um, what I do is, well, no, let me stay, but I do. Uh, I use a cattle mineral, a trace mineral salt, and that's what I use predominantly. But again, I'm up to 400 parts per million copper in that, and I pre-feed that but I have the colored uh, wooled animals and I have the long wool. And if you go back into um, the, the science of the, adding the color, you'll see that copper is needed to convert tyrosine to melanin, and melanin is what gives you the color in the fleece. And so I have a higher copper requirement in my flock in Colorado because of the high molybdenum and the sheep that I feed. So yes, I do provide that uh, trace mineral salt. I also provide a uh, blue block, and uh, particularly with my younger animals, because the only known use, and we are not copper deficient in Colorado, but the only known use of cobalt is for the production of vitamin B12. And vitamin B12 um, increases um, potential energy production. And that data ha was produced here at Colorado State. Uh, Dr. Sean Archibald produced it, that data, but so particularly with animals. So I use cobalt, and I use a trace mineral salt. OK, very good. And another question from the east. This is uh, from New York State, from Robin, and she raises Cotswolds. OK. OK, her question is, are you aware of any heightened mineral needs that UK evolved breeds, or just long wool breeds, have? And she provides some more info here. She says, we also have a proven copper deficiency in our flock and have been adding a bit of goat, goat mineral mix to the sheep minerals and are monitoring slaughter lamb livers and seeing good results with normalized copper levels. And it has helped with parasites, too. Um, so that's added info okay. there. Okay, if that helps, then I, uh, if it's, uh, don't break it, if it's working, don't break it kind of thing. I use cattle mineral, and I think uh, the goat mineral uh, would be higher than sheep, but not as high as cattle. And if the goat mineral is bringing your copper levels to where you need, um, then use it. 
you're doing exactly what you need. With the Cotswold, I'm assuming you also, those uh, being the long wool, the UK breeds, uh, and to answer your question, probably not all of the UK breeds. I just happen to have the Teased Waters, the Wensleydales, um, and the, the Lincolns. And uh, because of the long wool and because of the colors, you will have higher copper requirements. Okay. Um, and we have a question from an a different robin, but another robin nonetheless. What about flax? Robin <laughs> yeah. What about flax, sunflower, and pumpkin seeds? Do they do anything at all? Okay. Um, the flax would add omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I would love to do the research to see if there was an impact on adding those fatty acids. Um, I have not seen any data on that. We have an issue with a lot of people um, being able to. Um, uh, or having finding the scientist uh, to get the funding to do some more of this research. If we continue towards uh, an interest in wool, particularly for our military, because wool does not burn or it has a higher uh, ignition uh, where it ignites, um, perhaps this might occur. So I don't know of an issue with flax other than uh, perhaps if an animal was immune compromised or some health issues that might be of value. And that would be fun to do. I would love to do that. Regarding the pumpkin seed, I know there is some data to show, uh, and there's probably those that are listening that know more about this than I, to use as a parasite control is what it's used for. I have not done that to date. Oh, wow. I think it, I would rather use that because the resistance to ivermectin is always there. That's a new one for me. <laughs> Every day. Yeah. Fran asks about the uh, cobalt block. She wants to know, is there any copper in the cobalt, cobalt block that you showed there? No. Okay. No. The blue blocks are only cobalt-enhanced um, salt. Okay. Okay. I think that uh, I've answered all the questions I'm seeing here. If anybody else has any uh, questions... And type them in now real quick. We do have a couple more minutes. Or you can raise your hand, too. Don't be shy out there. Sometimes it's easier to just raise your hand and ask. And if the young lady with the CVM, the Ramadale CVM, if I did not answer her question correctly, I would be more than happy to, uh, to expand on that. Okay. I love my Ram Ramadale CVMs. <laughs> but I've been working... Uh, um, to register Ramadale's CVMs to, for improvement, uh, they have to be at least 75%. So I've been using Merino um, and a little bit of the um, Rambouillet because of the animals I brought from San Angelo, Texas Okay. Uh, to improve. Okay, Julie has asked a question, uh, do you feed all your breeds similarly depending on stage, late gestation, early lactation, etc., or do you feed differently for fine versus coarse wool breeds? Good question. Uh, what I do, Julie, is for the most, um, I, I as much when you start having more animals, it's a little bit more difficult, but I usually have three different pens. My caracals I always feed separately because you'll find with hair breeds in pr um, particular, you don't want them to get fat, um, and I'm going to feed them at a much uh, lower plane of nutrition. And in fact, I don't flush them. Um, or I don't, even late uh, gestation when I'm pasture lambing, I don't worry about adding anything to them because um, they're fat tail breeds, and with the fat tail breeds, if their tails get too fat, they don't breed. They can't lift the tail uh, for the ram, and we have greater dystocia. I also, the other two pens that I have are those that are easy keepers and those that are poor keepers. And so that's how I split all of my other uh, breeds, Teeswater, Wenslingdales, uh, CBMs, I feed them together. Okay. And Donna asks, how would you know if your flock is deficient in copper? I know you had the picture of the cattle up there, but okay. a little more expansion on the sheep side. Yeah, I would. Uh, and I have seen this. I was at Big E in Massachusetts here last year. I'm not going to be able to make it this year, and I saw a classic example of a copper deficiency. And I'm, I'm hands-on. I'm always handling my uh, fleeces uh, as we shear, and I skirt uh, a lot of them, the majority of them. And what you will see is as you open it up, there's stripes. Uh, you'll often see stripes in your wool or it tends to be coarser. They call that steely wool 
or acromotrichia is the verbiage that I used. Uh, go back to the example that I said, you need copper when you have the colored fleeces, you need copper to convert tyrosine, which is an amino acid, to melanin to give the, the fleece its color. So in a color fleece, you can see it with bands of color changes are often indicative of a copper deficiency or a steely wool, more coarse, uh, patchy type fiber is what I have seen. Okay. Um, and a question from Steve in Maine. He asks about your typical daily feeding schedule for uh, feeding your ewes. Okay, good question. And there's a lot of, uh, there's different philosophies on that. For the most, because I've gotten so many, when I have animals at maintenance, I, uh, I showed you or I talked a little bit about the alfalfa and about the corn stalks. What I do is I will feed them their alfalfa in the morning and then walk through the pens at night. I do not feed, um, I only feed once a day. However, as we start going with the flushing and as we go into late gestation, then I will feed twice a day. Um, particularly as we go to late gestation, early lactation, I will feed twice a day. Uh, just because I tend, I, when I first started with my animals, I tended to have a lot of obese animals because I fed them too much. And what you find is once you get an obese animal, they always will be obese. They will always want to overeat. And even their lambs will tend to overeat. And even their lambs will tend to overeat. So you, you need to I control that by feeding them once a day with the alfalfa to meet needs and then using corn stalks. Um, if you're going to feed twice a day, you're going to have to control yourself and to uh, feed smaller amounts. Okay. Time for just a couple more questions here. Christian asks, if the number of follicles is determined before birth, wouldn't the pre-weaning environment affect the growth traits more so, growth traits more so than the wool traits? Um, the, only the primary, um, well, the primary follicles and the secondary follicles um, are produced, but they still have an impact on how you feed them um, because the, the follicles aren't matured. That means um, they're created, but the actual hair or the wool fiber doesn't come out. So maturation of the primary follicle will be occurred by birth, but for the secondary follicle doesn't occur till later. And then expression of those follicles um, and the, the wool production is going to be linked to their energy needs. And their energy needs at that time are very, very high. And so you need to feed accordingly. If you were to underfeed them uh, when they're young lambs, you will have poor wool and poor growth. Okay. One final question here from uh, Robin, and I think she's trying to trap you, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> I, I'm, I can trap you. <laughs> no. She says, so weathers don't make good fiber pets. That's her question. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you go to New Zealand, they say it does. Um, uh -huh. I've had my uh, experience with weathers is limited uh, just because I'm of the belief that every animal in my place has to have a job or it doesn't stay. Mm -hmm. And the only animal that uh, ram that I kept that wasn't weathered is vasectomized, and I use him in my flock uh, to help synchronize my use, which is quite effective. Uh, the only time that I have done the weather is after four years, three or four years, uh, the fiber quality actually was reduced. Um, but there are others who have different experiences, particularly okay. in New Zealand. Yeah, so that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. If it works, but you do it. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. And I want to thank everybody uh, for their attendance tonight and, and thank Dr. Earlbeck for her excellent presentation and an excellent job answering folks' questions. Uh, and thanks to the audience. Yeah. The webinar doesn't work if you don't have an audience, so yeah. thank you, thank you. And thank you all. Um, once again, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with a link to this recording and then also a link to uh, Dr. Olbeck's slides uh, will be available for you too if you want to take a look at any of those pretty pictures that she had up there. And um, I'd like to remind all of you that we will have another uh, webinar coming up on October the 8th, and uh, we're going to have uh, Philip Berg and Mike Kasky from the uh, Pipestone uh, area of Minnesota with the uh, uh, community college up there giving us a presentation on lambing time management, and that'll be uh, at the same time, 7 o'clock Eastern on October the 8th, and you should all get a 
invitation to that, but please look for that registration information coming out soon. And once again, thank you to the American Sheep Industry Association and, and the Rebuild Our Flock um, Committee for providing funding for this uh, presentation and for all of our webinars. So with that, I'm going to bid all of you a good evening, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.